Welcome everyone to our September meetup, our first meetup of the fall, uh, and uh, one of several virtual meetups that we've had this year. We really appreciate your joining us virtually as we continue to have community as data and the greater good uh, over these past several months. I'm Elaine Gamble and I'm the community leader of data and the greater good and our focus as a community is the use of data in mission driven organizations. So how do nonprofits uh, use data to advance their vision uh, and their organizational goals. And we've had a number of wonderful organizations come and speak to us, and we're excited to have with us tonight USA for UNHCR, the United Nations Refugee Agency. To tell you a little bit more about uh, USA for UNHCR and our speaker, um, USA for UNHCR, the UN the UN Refugee Agency envisions a world without refugees. As the only organization dedicated to raise awareness and funds in the US for the UN Refugee Agency, USA for UNHCR has raised over $200 million to help refugees in the past five years. It serves nearly 71 million individuals who have been forced to flee their homes due to war, conflict, or persecution. And we're honored to have with us tonight, Nicole Smith. Nicole is the data analyst at the Hive, the innovation lab at USA for UNHCR, UN Refugee Agency. Nicole supports the fundraising teams at USA for UNHCR with expertise in experiment design and research analysis, including the deployment of machine learning models and dashboard visualization. Nicole holds a Master of Arts degree in quantitative methods in the social sciences from Columbia as well as the Master's in International Studies from the University of Oklahoma. Through her course and volunteer work, she has studied forced migration and conducted research on refugees in various countries, as well as research on migrant workers. She has also served as an ESL tutor. We're honored to have Nicole with us tonight, and I will turn it over to you, and welcome to Data and the Greater Good, Nicole. Hi, Elaine. Thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm really excited um, to talk to you guys about my organization and the data work that we do. And with that, I will begin sharing my screen. So tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about our organization and the data that we use um, in terms of strategy as well as implementation of this data. But first, um, I want to talk about the people that we serve and why our organization uh, is so critical for us to have data. This picture or pictures like this may be familiar. Um, you may have seen in the news over the past five years, the vast number of displaced people that are fleeing conflict, persecution, and violence in Syria, as well as the Horn of Africa, and traveling across the Mediterranean. Or you might be more familiar with the children of South Sudan, um, who fled first in the 90s when the Sudanese civil conflict broke out, and then again in the mid-2000s when the South Sudanese civil war broke out. And this is a generation known as the Lost Boys, as there were you know, thousands of young men fleeing Sudan um, to escape war. Or you might be more familiar with the most recent conflict where the nearly 1 million Rohingya refugees have fled Myanmar and resettled in a refugee camp such as this Cox Bazar in Bangladesh. But these three are simply a drop in the bucket. As Elaine mentioned, there are nearly 80 million displaced people around the world as of the end of 2019. Um, these displaced people include internally displaced people, as well as refugees, asylum seekers, and stateless individuals. And just because this is such a huge number, I think it's helpful to think of it in a smaller context. So this is about 37,000 people in a single day that are displaced. Um, as you might have learned when Elaine in my bio, I'm originally from Oklahoma, and the town that I grew up in had around 35,000 people. And so I often think that each day, if that entire town was displaced, what would that look like? And that kind of gives context to the situation. Another way to think about it is to think back to when UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, was first formed. This came out of World War II and all of the refugees displaced um, by Nazi Germany. So in 1951, there was one displaced person per 1,000 people around the world. But in 2019, there's one displaced person per 100 people around the world. So we're really dealing with the largest displaced persons crisis to date. 
Now, before I dive into the data, some of you may be wondering the difference between UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, and where I work, USA for UNHCR. The best way to put it is that USA for UNHCR is an association of the UN Refugee Agency. Um, the UN Refugee Agency is the world's leading organization with an international mandate to aid and protect those who are forced to flee their homes because of violence, conflict, and persecution. They're the ones on the ground within 24 hours when a crisis breaks out to serve refugees and displaced people. USA for UNHCR is UNHCR's national partner in the US. We support UNHCR's effort around the globe through fundraising, advocacy, innovation, and private sector engagement. We are on the ground in the US and we are a nonprofit. And then to further complicate things, I work on a team known as The Hive. Um, we are the innovation lab at USA for UNHCR. We are comprised of five individuals, a data scientist, a data analyst, myself, um, a data visualization designer, a data engineer, and then our director. Um, our mission is to engage with the American public to change the conversation around refugees using data science and machine learning. And our data is primarily fundraising data. Um, so while we do collaborate with UNHCR on a lot of issues to you know, use data science and machine learning in that space, the main chunk of our data is fundraising data, and that's what I'll be talking about tonight. So I'd like to go into our data story. And I, I think that our data story is not really a unique one. I think it's probably true of a lot of nonprofits or even private sector companies. Um, we've had a lot of growth in the last five years, and I'm excited to share that with you tonight. One key part of our success in our data story is that we have a group of 11 data experts, known as our data advisory board, that kind of serve as a soundboard for us to keep us up to date with what's going on in the private sector and in other innovative spaces so that we can stay up to date with that despite having the resources of a nonprofit. So I'm gonna go chronologically in our story, although our story is not without roadblocks and our story is not without random loops that we take and started back in the same place, um, but I think chronological is the best way to share what we've been working on thus far. So as I mentioned, the Hive was founded in 2015 um, towards the end, and so I'd like to get started in the bulk of the 2016-2017 years. We were formed um, in reaction to the Obama micro-targeting campaign that you may be familiar with that both Civis and Blue Labs have adopted in the years since, and we were charged with taking these micro-targeting strategies to the refugee space. So that meant how can we target donors in a better way? How can we reach them with messages that they relate to and use sophisticated data science and machine learning to do this? And so we started with a machine learning model. We collaborated with an external vendor and used a survey to understand the American population. And from there, this general national um, survey, we used a machine lear learning algorithm to score them on five different indices, which you'll see at the bottom of the first box. So that would support score, their likelihood for supporting the refugee cause. Contact was their likelihood for, um, you know, wanting to be contacted by the refugee agency. Their awareness score and their knowledge score were two indicators understanding, you know, how much they knew about the crisis. Was it that these were people who would likely support if only they knew more? And then we also looked at a lookalike score to understand how those donors that we were trying to reach looked like our current donors. Um, th the bulk of the time we were interested in low lookalikes so that we could continue to grow in new ways and target new audiences. This is data science at its core and it was really, really exciting and it worked. Um, in 2015 and 2016, they ran, we ran 32 micro-targeting campaigns. One of them was Jesus was a refugee to understand how we could better engage with evangelical Christians in the US. And another was rainbow refugees to relate to LGBTQ communities around how a lot of refugees and displaced people are fleeing violence and persecuted related to their sexual identity. And this is really exciting for us. Um, and this is the model that we used for two years. In addition to that, as being a nonprofit, um, we love hackathons. And hackathons have been the bread and butter since the very beginning, but we didn't necessarily have the data at this point. Um, and so we challenged this group of community when we did a data kind data dive uh, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to help us understand how we could use geospatial data to better understand the refugee crisis. 
It was this very broad idea that we went to and we had a dedicated group of hackers that came up with a solution in a weekend. And that solution was using geospatial data to tag tents and to understand how refugee camps are growing by using this labeled tent data. However, we didn't have labeled tent data. So we kind of had to go back to the drawing board and we partnered with a satellite um, company known as Tom Nod to use a crowdsourcing campaign where when this website was active, you could go on, start searching, anybody could do it. And you would look at, you know, small images, one by one meters of, of uh, camps and tag those and then also label the non-tent areas. Uh, this was super exciting. And what this allowed us to do is that we were able to then use a machine learning model with the help of Stanford AI and Sustainability Lab and take this information and plot how refugee camps were going, both in terms of the influx of refugees in the last five years and as well as protracted situations. Um, for those of you that don't know, the average stay in a refugee camp for a refugee is 18 years. And so we really wanted to understand how these camps are fluid and dynamic and how we can use machine learning to better understand how they're growing and how we can, you know, increase water access in some places or add an educational facility in others. At the end of this year, it was a whirlwind. Um, and we were recognized by Fast Company as an innovative, one of the most innovative nonprofits. Um, so that's where we started. And now we're shifting into 2018 and 2019, which is when I joined the high. And I'd like to take a second to explain the core of our current model of the high. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. This is a data science pyramid developed by a data scientist, Monica Rigotti, who works at LinkedIn. And it really describes kind of how you get to that fun, shiny stuff that all data scientists want to do, right? That look-alike model that we developed after a survey and we scored the entire population. How do you take the steps to get there? And as you might have noticed in the previous slides, we were really focused on the AI and ML. And it got us far and we understood what was happening. And it wasn't a lack of, you know, methodology or understanding the science behind it. It was just that we didn't have the right data to support this in the long run. When I started in May of 2018, I'll never forget my first day on the job. I started, sat down at my desk, looked over to my coworker, and was really excited to just get my hands dirty. I was fresh out of grad school and I was like, okay, I've heard all about this querying language SQL. No one can ever tell me where I can use this because I don't have a data warehouse to access. So let's get to it. She looks over and she says, we don't have access to the data right now in the kind of capacity that you're thinking. The way that we access our fundraising data is we go to our CRM, you can write a query there, um, but you're restricted to 10 megabytes of data. And for the kind of work that we were interested in doing, right, using sophisticated data science and machine learning models to help refugees and fundraise for them, 10 megabytes of data was a very cumbersome loop to go through. So in 2018, we decided to really focus on this bottom three parts of the pyramid. So both collecting the data, moving and storing it, so making it accessible, exploring and transforming, right? What are ways that we need to look at the data in a different way? Um, how else can we you know, subsidize stuff? As well as aggregate and analyze, so we needed to understand what was in the data but we weren't quite touching the testing and experimentation or AI and machine learning. So the next chunk will really be focusing on that bottom part. We built a pipeline. Um, this may look very simple, but essentially it was a lot of work uh, in which our data engineer and data scientists did, and they funneled all of the different data sources that we have into a data warehouse. So we have two CRMs, which is quite complicated. And we were able to create copies of all of that data that's refreshed on a daily basis and put that in our warehouse for use by our data team. We were also able to take various web apps like Facebook and Google Analytics and add those metrics to our existing donor pool to better understand how they were interacting with us outside of just transactions. And then finally, we looked at other data sources. So we have access to um, the voter file, which includes various demographics and voting behavior, as well as an audio file from our call center that was stored on someone's local computer that had transcripts of all of the calls coming out of our donor center. And this became really useful in just understanding why people were calling and how we could better allocate 
uh, the needs of our donors before they called. But data isn't just for the data team. And so in addition to making the data easily accessible, we decided to train other team members. So in this photo, you'll see that there's, I think maybe 10 to 12 people, only three of them are on the data team. Um, and we had SQL and Tableau learning sessions among our whole organization to empower them to both make better business decisions and use data in their daily lives and understand how that data could influence their business decisions. So all of these people are now SQL and Tableau experts. Once we were able to um, understand our data, we could reach donors in a new and a better way, I think. Um, it's really tricky for nonprofits to often report, you know, on where the money is going or how you can allocate that one dollar I donated. And that's often a question that donors want to understand, but they don't want to hear, as my favorite joke is, that your dollar is donating to fund a light bulb. So what we did was we aggregated donations by the city. So you'll see there were 614 donations made in Seattle in this dollar amount and translated that to what it could buy in a refugee camp. So in that instance, it was almost 3,000 mosquito nets. Um, and we found this as a really effective tool to just better target our donors and better reach them where they are. So, so far, data has empowered us to make better decisions and better reach our donors. In addition, we started teetering up to the top of the pyramid with experiments. Um, and in 2019, we began a partnership with the Harvard Business School to help us retain our monthly donors. So while we were doing this aggregating and analyzing our data, we noticed that among our monthly donors, who we call sustainers, there was a pretty significant drop off at the four month mark. And we realized that this was not sustainable in the long run for us to spend the money to get sustainers to just lose them in such a short time period. And so in our partnership with Harvard Business School, we designed a pretty sophisticated experiment that ran for nine months. And the simple part of it is that it was both the number of emails that you received and the amount of text in those emails. And we use this and the cross relationship between them to measure, um, you know, engagement with us and, and kind of your feeling of support as you read these emails. And then by the end of the experiment, we increased retention by seven percentage points, which is quite exceptional for this kind of experiment to be able to increase it like that. And we're continuing to work on this. Um, this was the first of its kind at U4U. We often do, sorry, USA for U and HDR. We often do um, experimentation, but it's simple A-B testing, right, red or blue. Um, but in this instance, we ran it for a long amount of time to better understand how long-term engagement can increase donor retention. But we didn't forget our hackathons. <laughs> As I mentioned in the beginning, we used the hackathon model in 2017. In 2018, we brought our hackathons in-house um, and we partnered with Airbnb and DonorsChoose.org to better understand how resettled refugees are accessing education in the U.S., as well as what kind of volunteer opportunities can we glean for American citizens to engage with refugees so that they can better understand the crisis and the needs of refugees. This was really exciting for us, as you can see in the photo. It was a 72-hour hackathon. Um, and we got a lot done and we learned a lot about what kind of data we need to collect to answer these questions and how we could better serve refugees in the process. We did two hackathons in 2019. It was quite a busy year for us, especially as these hackathons were back to back. Um, and again, we kind of had this focus of like, how can we, you know, how can we answer this question and what other kind of data do we need to get? So, at the first hackathon, we partnered with the Parsons School of Design and focused around visualization. And the question we asked was, how can we visualize refugees' access to water so that Americans can understand, you know, that, that type of constraint that you have living in a camp? So, for example, refugees have access to about 20 liters of water, and one participant developed this amazing visualization that showed how much 20 liters of water gets you in the U.S. and, like, one toilet flush is all it gets you. Um, and so that was really interesting to understand that difference, even after having worked at the organization for three years of just seeing the dichotomy between water access. The second hackathon that we did was very new for us, and we partnered with the Anne and Bernard Spitzer School of Architecture at City College and New Lab to host a hackathon for architects. Um, this was so cool and so out of my day-to-day -day as a data analyst. Um, but we essentially challenged them to help us understand 
shelter and structure in refugee camp in reaction to both climate change and these protracted situations. So the plastic tents that you may be familiar with at the UN Refugee Agency are not meant to last for 18 years. Um, when, that, when that was first developed, you know, refugee crises were much shorter and people could return home. And so we, we kind of brainstormed around how can we improve shelter and how can we use the leftover tents to create new structures in the camp. A whirlwind of two years. At the end, we were recognized um, by the ANA Genius Awards as a genius in data analytics for the category of growth. Um, this was a really cool project for us as we, or acknowledgement for us as we were acknowledged alongside huge corporations. Um, so really great to see that our data and our culture is changing and is being acknowledged. Now I'll shift to 2020. And you may realize in the slide that this has programmatic work. And I want to take a brief second to explain that. So up to this point, as I mentioned, our data is primarily fundraising data, and then we substitute in hackathon models to understand what other kind of data we can collect and to just use the power of the community. In 2020, we're shifting to programmatic work, meaning work that directly impacts the lives of refugees, both in the US and abroad. Um, sometimes we're using machine learning to do this, but sometimes we're going back to the bottom of the pyramid to just know what data we need to collect to be able to get to that top part. Um, the most shiny of the shiny. We did our first machine learning model in-house this year and we built cluster analysis for our digital donors. So we were able to, you know, predict what clusters they belong in and then add a propensity score for how that might best relate to a campaign that they would respond to. And we built an automated pipeline for this to go into Facebook and then there's a threshold score that's set that retrains the model after enough data has been added. But the programmatic and the shiny this year is that we partnered with a legal team at UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, to develop a machine learning and text analysis around case law. Um, so essentially the process is when you're filing for refugee or asylum status, these are both legal statuses and you often need a lawyer to assist you. Now, this is quite cumbersome work as a lawyer, as there's a whole host of things that qualify you for these special legal statuses, depending on the country that you're from and the country that you're filing in. So what we were able to do is using text analysis and a PDF converter, able to tag all of the case law in the database that, and categorize it by theme, so that lawyers who are assist, assisting these um, asylum seekers and those claiming refugee status with past cases that they could reference. So rather than manually combing through all of this data, you know, thousands and thousands of case loads, they were able to type in a search word and find supporting materials for refugees, which can then help them advocate for these individuals. We continued with the hackathon model, but focused on the programmatic, where we did our first virtual hackathon. Um, much like a virtual experience like this, it was new for us and we enjoyed it. We were selected for a hackathon with Microsoft as one of the partners, and we challenged our team of about 25 to help us understand how we could build a tool to assist resettled refugees. So when refugees are first resettled in the US, they are assigned to one of the nine resettlement agencies. You may be familiar with some of them if you're aware of Catholic Charities um, or HIAS, um, but those services are only provided for those refugees for the first 90 days. And on day 91, they're integrated in the community and they have to survive on their own. Um, we know that 90 days is not sufficient, um, and I won't get into the political reasons for why that's the period, but what's important is that there are thousands of nonprofits that do work with refugees in the US to provide them the services they need. So it becomes a factor of identification of those nonprofits rather than just lack of resources. So we challenged this group to help us understand how we could build this tool. What's the tool that you need? What are some barriers that you need to get around? And from this weekend, we then partnered with the Opportunity Project, which is a part of the Census Open Innovation Lab, um, to take this project prompt on a 12-week sprint, where we're now building the prototypes that we discussed in the hackathon, creating tools that address things like English language learning, access to healthcare, um, how to get your kids enrolled in school, 
And that's all pre-COVID. So when we think about the fact that now resettled refugees are having to do all of this in a virtual world, it just seems so daunting. And so having a tool that makes sense for them is great. And we're using pictures in case they're not familiar with the English language um, and can help guide them through it. So we're really excited to see how this prototype develops in the next couple of weeks. And then I wanna bring it back real quickly to the data. So as I've alluded to this whole time, it's about collecting data and understanding, you know, what kind of data you need to solve problems. And while we're shifting into, towards the programmatic work, we don't want to forget our initial goal and in drawing on our fundraising data. And so this year we've completed five market research projects um, to better supplement that data and understand what's going on with our donors as well as the general population. And so we've run several surveys this year, understanding how do Americans relate to the refugee cause. How do they understand USA for UNHCR or the UN Refugee Agency? And how can we better relate to these individuals and, and help them understand that refugees are just like you and me? Um, in addition to that, we also have run credit card spending data to understand how our donors and our potential donors are spending their money and how you know maybe there's a partnership that we can have with another agency or organization to help them spend their money you know in conjunction with refugees and then we also ran analyses on our existing donors to understand those trends as well as some support or sentiment that they might have you know in the ever-changing times so with that i'll throw it back to the data science pyramid and i just want to leave this here where it's broken out a little bit more um, but this is really the core of our model. It's something that we continue to do. And as I said, you know, I presented a chronological journey, but we're constantly going back down, right? So we'll move up, get to testing and experimentation, and then we're reassessing, you know, what is the other data that we could use? How can we better supplement what we have to improve outcomes for refugees? And I think that that's really important for us um, to often be asking ourselves this question of, it's not only a matter of how can we serve refugees with the data that we have, but in an ideal world, what's the data that we would need in order to be able to serve these refugees? And with that, I will close for um, questions. And I just, again, want to reiterate my thanks for coming to join this talk tonight. I know it's late, um, but I'm happy to be here and answer any questions that you might have about my role, the organization, or the refugee crisis. Informative talk. And before we go into Q&A, I want to acknowledge Bill Prickett from Prickett Media, who has coordinated this virtual experience. Thank you so much, Bill, including the video recording of tonight's talk. So we really appreciate uh, your uh, orchestration of, that, uh, of this experience. And if you have questions, you can type them into the chat box. And uh, I will call on you to share your question, or if you prefer I share it, you can indicate that. We certainly like hearing directly from uh, our members and attendees, um, but uh, that is up to you as to whether you want to share or you would like uh, me to share it. Um, so on that note, um, I have the first question that I will share with you, Nicole, and that is, um, how has COVID-19 impacted your fundraising initiatives uh, given the difficult times uh, that we're in? Have you seen any impact at all on your ability to raise funds for this cause? Yeah, thank you. So I'm sure like many others, COVID-19 has changed the way that we work, some ways for the better, some ways for the worse. Um, thank goodness we haven't actually seen a negative downturn on a lot of our fundraising initiatives. We've been exploring this. Um, I think part of it, is that people are home more they're more interested in relating to you know something bigger than us right we're all sitting at home and we're feeling you know down in the dumps or just tired of looking at the same four walls and so being able to relate to a refugee or donating to a refugee cause is really important to a lot of our donors and so we've seen a recent uptick um but i think another factor is that <laughs> In addition to all of the crazy things that have happened this year, there have been several refugee emergencies. So as of last week, there was a refugee camp in Greece that burned down. Um, and so we often see a correlation between emergency giving um, and those emergencies that happen. And so we're still working on from a data perspective in terms of teasing out what was the cause of this increase in fundraising. Um, but I think it's a, 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 you know, a combination of both 
there's been emergencies this year that our donors are relating to, but there's also just, I think, a greater need for giving in 2020 um, that's really causing, you know, an uptick, which is great for us because we were really fearful in the beginning with COVID and the economic downturn that we would be forgotten. And so we're excited to see that we're still chugging along okay right now. <laughs> Thank you. So then on a related note, in general, fundraising is somewhat immune to the economy, that you have a steady stream of funders, the, it, the fundraising levels don't change with the economy. Is that a fair statement based on what you said? I think it depends. I think in the 2008 recession, there was a much greater plummet. But again, it's difficult to tease out, was that an issue of awareness? So for some additional context, in 2015, as I show the picture of the Mediterranean crisis, um, when Alan Turkey washed off the shore, which was the three-year-old boy on the Turkish shore, that was one of the moments that everyone started paying attention, right? We all woke up to the fact that refugees are all around the world and they're being persecuted and they're fleeing violence and conflict. And our organization tripled in that year. Um, so it's hard for us to kind of analyze from a data perspective what the downturn will look like in terms of nonprofit funding. Um, I think we're positive that you know we can continue to fundraise for refugees, but I don't wanna say that it's unrelated because we do see little blips. Um, I'm hoping that the data that we've provided as tools for our fundraising team is helpful and that we can target the right donors at the right time to increase funds rather than being, you know, super subjected to the economic downturns that are hopefully almost done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we have a question from Serena. Serena, do you want to share your question? Oh, sure. Um, thank you, Nicole, for uh, for that presentation and for Elaine for facilitating. It's been really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, uh, it seems like the Hive is relatively independent in some ways. Um, and so I was just uh, curious as far as like the areas of focus for the campaigns and the hackathons, like to what extent um, does the Hive decide that versus um, having that be guided or mandated by the UNHCR? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think your assumptions are right. I know that they're right. So we are an independent agency. And with that, and especially as an innovation lab, we get to decide our projects. Now we do have like reporting mechanisms, of course. Um, but because we're the innovation lab, we get to just try a bunch of stuff and see kind of what happens. Um, so that has enabled us to choose all the prompts for our hackathons. And then we work in conjunction with our fundraising team to do like different campaigns and, and ad targeting, mostly because we want to tap into their business knowledge, right? Of they know the best messaging to send, but we can help identify the best audience to send that message to. So it's a lot of collaboration um, with other teams, but normally we're coming, we call ourselves the disruptors a lot internally to say like, hey, we have this idea, you know, we vetted it with research, what are your thoughts on it? Um, we'd love to collaborate on it. And it works both with our fundraising team as well as with UNHCR. Um, although sometimes there is, you know, the off chance that they might not be interested in a project and we just run with it and see what happens based on the research that we've done before. Mm -hmm. um, so how can someone have a low lookalike score, but a high support score? Is that seems counterintuitive. Yes, so the support Thoughts score is, yeah, the support score is based on um, a host of survey questions, kind of around like, are you sympathetic to refugees? Um, do you know what a refugee is? Um, what's your perspective on like US spending for refugees? Should we be doing more? Should we be doing less? Should we admit more refugees in? So that is what um, influences the support score, right? So understanding who refugees are, um, understanding who UNHCR is, that tends to kind of make think us and the machine know that they are in support of the refugee cause. Um, and the lookalike score is more so based on demographics, right? So I think it's pretty typical of nonprofits that most donors are white women over the age of 50. And so the lookalike score is reflective of the demographics, right? So we, would, we can get a new individual, maybe a younger millennial, that's very in tune with the world or at least very in tune with the refugee crisis, giving them a high support score, but they would have a low lookalike score. 
um, because they don't look like our current donors in terms of demographics. I see, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So as you consider the current political climate that we're in or the Washington administration, you said that it doesn't necessarily impact your fundraising. Is that because new fundraisers come in that may not have been brought in before? Like how are you able to sustain those levels given the, the climate in Washington around a lot of these areas? Yeah, I think it's because we're because we're independent of both uh, the U.S. government and UNHCR. We're an association of UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, but we're independent. We're able to sustain fundraising, and that we're 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 an apolitical unit. Um, that sometimes gets tricky because refugees are a political issue. Um, but our core mission is changing the world, and our vision is a world without refugees. So we remain apolitical in that. Um, and we obviously advocate for more support of refugees at times, but whether or not a politician or a candidate is interested in that is kind of outside of it. And so I think that that helps sustain our fundraisers. On the other half, sometimes it's difficult because people want us to be doing more, um, right? We're seen as a steward for refugees, and we are, but it's difficult to not get into that political space. Um, I think most of our, like most of my colleagues are very passionate about this cause and so do things outside of the organization. But as an organization, we can't make a point, um, especially with potential to be defunded as a UN agency about um, an administration or a political politician. So it's tricky. It's a very delicate balance. Um, but I think that overall, because our fundraising goes directly to refugees and bypasses any kind of government, that is how we can maintain our, our fundraising targets um, and continue to get new donors despite an ever-changing political climate. Great. And um, earlier you mentioned Donors Choose and Donors Choose has been a past speaker here. We, we really enjoyed um, having them. And tell us more about your partnership with Donors Choose. So they fund public school projects. Um, what, how did you partner with them in this area? Yes, of course, that's a great question. And we too love DonorsChoose.org. They're one of our favorite partners. Um, and I should say that both DonorsChoose.org and myself, and then I know that Nick from Global Giving has been here. We sit on a consortium of just data scientists and analysts at nonprofits so that we can understand common problems and we brainstorm. It's really fun. And so that's how I got connected with Donors Choose. And we partnered with them extensively at our hackathon. So it was a co-branded hackathon. Um, but the project that we did together, so we each had one project that was unique to our organization. And then we explored a recommender system for teachers that have refugees in their classroom. So for those that may not be as familiar with DonorsChoose.org, their model is crowdfunding resources for teachers that they post, you know, I need paper, et cetera. Um, and there's often a difficult time when a new teacher signs up for them to know kind of what resources to ask for. And we thought that that problem also related to teachers that have refugee students. Um, and Donors Truth has a whole host of data sources. And so we were able to identify um, teachers that had refugee students and what kind of things they asked for versus teachers that just got their first refugee student. So for example, something that we found in the data was that one teacher asked for a mattress and it was crowdfunding for a mattress for her refugee student, which is not something that you would normally see in a classroom. Um, and so that kind of illuminated for us the difference in needs for refugees and how we can partner with that. So that was the result of the hackathon with building out a recommender system. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you again uh, to all. And again, our special thanks to you, Nicole, for a very informative talk. Yeah, Have thank you a so much. Good evening, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.